Ryan Berkman's. Welcome back to Real Vision. It's always a pleasure to have you here on the platform. Uh, for those who may not have seen our earlier episode and who are not yet familiar with your work, you're an independent investor, uh, an Ethereum community member, something that you're just truly passionate about. Uh, and it really comes through when you talk about Ethereum. Today, we're going to talk about two topics today uh, that are very important in the Ethereum ecosystem, NFTs uh, and Ethereum changes coming to the network, ETH 2.0, scaling solutions, uh, hard forks, all that and more. Very excited to have you back with us today, Ryan. Thanks, Ash. Great to be back. So let's just jump in uh, and talk about NFTs. I think that um, there are a lot of misconceptions about what NFTs are and what they aren't. Uh, I think many people from the traditional finance side uh, think of uh, NFTs as kind of uh, digital cabbage patch kids when they have a great deal more uses. How do you think about NFTs big picture? Right, Ash. So NFTs leaped into the limelight earlier this year uh, with the rise of predominantly crypto art collectibles. And these are the cabbage patch kids. These are folks paying, you know, folks who perhaps have had some financial success on the upswing in crypto and they want to enjoy that. They want to feel community and they're outlaying sometimes tens or even hundreds of thousands of dollars for these so-called JPEGs or Cabbage Patch Kids. Sometimes uh, over t over 10 million. I think the record is over $10 million uh, for uh, some of the uh, some crypt, uh, crypto punks and uh, board ape. And these are huge numbers that we're seeing out there. Just absolutely huge numbers. Uh, if I recall correctly, the top uh, sale ever for one unit was uh, Beeple, the famous artist, sold a single NFT for $69 million. I believe it was a collage of all of his daily art that he's been doing for something like yeah. 5,000 days. So great work by him. And recently, in the past week or two, uh, we've seen a single NFT collection created by a community member uh, raise over uh, $70 million, uh, just one collection, and even more amazingly, did so in a matter of uh, minutes, uh, just absolutely oversubscribed in terms of the launch of that collection. So NFTs have certainly light, leaped into the limelight as a fundraising vehicle or a, a uh, a, a collective action collectibles vehicle. Uh, they've leaped into the limelight as a, a way to uh, express yourself in the crypto community uh, involving, you know, crypto art and collectibles. But there's really something deeper going on here. At their heart, NFTs are a technology standard, kind of like security certificates for your web browser, where what is an NFT? Well, uh, first of all, when we say NFTs, we, we might mean the NFT standard as a technology standard, or we may mean the specific individual piece of property that's in my crypto wallet or could be in your crypto wallet. And so NFTs are a distinct piece of personal digital property, kind of like, you know, a scarf knit for you by your grandmother. It is a distinct piece of property that uh, is unique, uh, not the same thing as a can of Coca-Cola, where if you and I right. both have unopened Coke cans, we can swap cans and we have the same can. Just the same thing with crypto tokens like Ether, like Bitcoin. If you and I have one Ether, we effectively have the same Ether. Those are fungible tokens. With the NFTs, right. that's the non-fungible token, each of us has, has distinct personal digital property, and we're just seeing a, a range of interesting use cases uh, for, for the NFT vehicle. You know, it's so interesting. I, I tend to think of it as a kind of a digital fingerprint that uses the underlying cryptography uh, that powers uh, these tokens uh, to create digital uh, uniqueness in this space. It's interesting because everyone who comes to uh, the crypto space comes from a different position. For people who haven't already guessed, uh, you're someone who's formally studied computer science. Um, for people who come from the financial space, we're used to the idea uh, of fungibility. If you think about something like a, a barrel of oil, one barrel of oil is uh, equal to uh, another barrel of oil, assuming that the parameters are the same, WTI or Brent, for example, uh, and North Sea crude, these ideas of, of fungibility. And that's what we have with Bitcoin coin with the Ethereum tokens, but NFTs are different in that everyone, as you say, is unique, like the scarf your grandmother 
knitted for you, and it's provably unique uh, using uh, the ERC721 standard, which is what you're referring to when you were talking about the, the overarching standards behind this. Give us a little bit of a thumbnail sketch for people who don't have computer science backgrounds uh, about what ERC721 is and why it's so important to understanding the way NFTs function. For sure. So what ERC721 is, is it's a bit like a shipping container for the idea of personal digital property. If we look at shipping containers, this is a standard technology that not only made it very convenient to put your stuff inside the standard shipping container, where if I have some stuff, I'd like to ship my stuff, I'm able to just say, send me a shipping container, and I don't care which one it is. Uh, and at the same time, the shipping container, uh, as a, as a, you know, having a standard dimensions, you know, probably standard materials, not my area. They can build that to spec around the world's ports. So if you're in a port in, in Venice uh, or one in South America, they can just expect the same standard shipping containers. And that's what we're seeing in the NFT space where ERC 721 means that when you and I, as builders and creators, when we launch our own NFT collection or we use the NFT standard for something more financial related or exotic, and we'll get into some examples later, we can be assured that the NFT we create will in fact be interoperable with the hundreds of different infrastructure plays currently ongoing in the Ethereum and crypto ecosystems. So right. by far right now, the most famous infrastructure platform is going to be your OpenSea.io. So OpenSea is a place where you go to buy, sell, and list NFTs. It's been billed as sort of an Amazon.com for NFTs. And it's important to understand that OpenSea, as successful and great as it's been and, and will continue to be, in, in my opinion, it, it's a layer on top of the digital property rights that are created and secured on the blockchain and by the blockchain. Yeah, this is a, such a such an important point here. First of all, I just love this metaphor uh, of containerization of containers being uh, this uh, metaphor for the way that you see NFTs. Containerization for people on the uh, nerdy econ side is one of the quietest economic revolutions we've had uh, in the world in the last 50 years. And the idea that you can create a standard uh, for the container aspect of it. And then what's internal, uh, what's inside the container, the bicycles or the, you know, brie cheese or whatever that's being shipped in it uh, is unique and specific. It's such a fascinating one. You just transitioned to talking about uh, OpenSea, which is uh, what I guess you could say maybe to continue the metaphor, uh, it's the busiest port uh, in the NFT space. It's the marketplace uh, where people are buying and selling and exchanging these tokens. Tell us a little bit about that for people who aren't familiar, who may not have been to OpenSea yet. Give us a little bit of a sense of what that means and why it's significant. Right, Ash. OpenSea has a great analogy in Amazon in that on Amazon, we have merchants, which would be called creators on OpenSea. And we have shoppers on Amazon, which would be called collectors, NFT collectors on OpenSea. And they need a place where they can browse available collections, view emerging trends, filter for NFTs of interest. They want to view their own NFTs in their own crypto wallet. Without software like OpenSea, all of that data is resident on the blockchain. And because the Ethereum blockchain is a single global computer, the cost of memory and computational resources, you know, the, the Amazon cloud bill for Ethereum is quite high and it makes it a poor fit for many of the follow-on complementary services that really maximize the impact of NFTs as a, as a vehicle and as a cultural phenomenon. So to put that in plainer English, if you want to bid on NFTs, if you want to list NFTs for sale, you want to search for different trends. You want to follow your friends' collections. All of those capabilities rightly live in different software stacks outside of the Ethereum blockchain. And the fact that you own your own NFT data is the most fundamental base layer of the whole NFT trend. 
It's your personal digital property. And today you can interact with your personal digital property by connecting your crypto wallet to OpenSea. But OpenSea has many competitors as well as it, it might be said that OpenSea fundamentally has a, uh, a different sort of a moat than something like an eBay, because while they do create many kinds of original data in terms of metadata and trends and auction capabilities, at the end of the day, they're, they're a layer that just, they're a convenience layer between you and your personal digital property that's inside your crypto wallet secured by the Ethereum blockchain. So OpenSea, very big, very exciting, but also having in some ways fundamentally less power than some of the Web2 marketplaces of the previous generation of technology. Hey, if you like this clip, be sure to check out the full interview and more only on realvision.com forward slash crypto. It's 100% free. Sign up now.